Okay, uh, my name is Leonard Snyder. And how, what's, what's your relationship to this area? Okay, uh, my family came here, the Baileys came here right before the Civil War. We've been here ever since. My great-grandfather, Milton Bailey, was in on the founding of Chautauqua and with the Reverend Flood formed the Chautauqua uh, Daily Herald. We've got letters that he wrote from Chautauqua in 1872 before Miller and Company came there. So this, this I feel when I'm, I'm home. I currently live in California. I left Jamestown in 1949, went to the University of Arizona, graduated mining engineering. My first job was surveying the Lucky Cuss Mine in Tombstone, Arizona. Um, I went down there, I bumped my head, my glasses steamed up, and I came out of there. After graduating from cum laude and mining engineering, I'd never go into another mine as long as I lived. So I joined the Shell Oil Company, where I thought I could do um, geology and so forth at the surface. Had 32 addresses in three or four years, and that was enough for me, especially when I found that they're going to send me to Houston, Texas, which if you go to Houston, Texas, you don't want to call that home. So I went back to UCLA, got my degree in electronic engineering, and uh, till I retired until now, I've worked for NASA. Um, my job from the very beginning of space flight till now was to put the cameras on the spacecraft. So, not bragging, but if you've ever seen a picture of Jupiter, Mars, or Saturn, I'm sure that's my camera that took the picture. I um, retired when all the cameras were still working. And we've got a uh, place on Chautauqua Lake. I came here for an early, for a reunion 20 years ago. My mother was getting a little bit old to be with. We rented a place. I walked out that front door. Instead of seeing Chestnut Street where I grew up, I saw Chautauqua Lake. I went down and without a cent of anything, um, bought the place. And um, got a little trouble paying for it, but it's there and we love it. Um, I've always loved history. Across the street from Chestnut Street lived the Knee Banks, and um, there was a connection with the Knee Banks and Bob Jackson, and whenever he came down the street, we knew he was coming. Uh, all little kids had to line up to see the, the big Packard come down the street. So Bob Jackson then was a, was a hero. I mean, we, we knew about him well before the Supreme Court days. Um, he lived on the corner at Fairmont Avenue, at the corner of Hanford Avenue. Um, my grandparents, the Baileys, lived right next door. Um, the properties were big, and they, they had a full-time gardener that they shared. He'd be some days at the Jackson's house and some days at my grandparents' house. So we were going back and forth at that time. I can remember, it was always Bob Jackson. It was never Mr. Jackson, never Robert Jackson. It was always Bob Jackson. And I can remember his wife. I can remember him. Um, Just go, stop for a second. Describe him. If you had to close your eyes and describe Bob Jackson. Well, one thing, he didn't smile much. <laughs> I, I, I can remember that. Um, he was extremely good looking, in, even in the eyes of a kid. Um, he dressed very nicely. You never kept, caught him in Levi's or dungarees, and he had a presence. Mm -hmm. He wasn't scary, but we, we, he had a presence about him. And your, the kids were Bill and Mary? I can't remember the children. Yeah. Isn't that funny? When we went up there, it was every Sunday up there, and I, I have no recollection of the children. How old would they be today? I am 72. Yeah, they and I'm in getting, the early 80s. So they, they might have been a little bit they been to school. older, yeah, or, but I, I can't remember them. And, um, you know, I'm getting back an awful long time. The only thing that I can remember clearly is when the Jacksons got a new type of fire extinguisher. Up till then, they were those brass things that hung on the wall with a <laughs> red hose that came out. You turned upside down. This was something new. And my grandfather, uh, B.M. Bailey, and Bob Jackson got behind his house and lit a small fire. They're going to try out the new thing. And before that, they was over. <laughs> we had fire trucks up there trying to contain the fire because that thing, we should have had the old brass thing with the, with the red hose on it. Um, my uh, uncle was Ernest D. Leet, Ernie Leet, and I went camping to Canada with him every year. He was just a wonderful guy. 
and uh, he was Jackson's partner in the law firm of Jackson, Durkin, and Leet. And even as a child, I had enough wits about me to always wonder how a Democrat like Bob Jackson and a Republican, and I mean a really Republican, I think he started the Young Republicans Club here, could be in the same law firm together, but they were. And uh, uh, when, when, when Bob Jackson moved away, then the Kneebanks left Chestnut Street and moved up into that house. And there was Jim Kneebank and I, we've been friends ever since he died just very recently. So about the only thing I can add is that um, when he lived in Jamestown, he was a presence. It, it didn't take the Supreme Court and, uh, to, make, to make him as big as he was. And I've always been interested in history and to think that we had somebody from Jamestown, New York, this community tucked away in the Alleghenies in western New York State who produced a man who tried all the Nazi monsters is more than, more than I can comprehend. There was Goering, there was Himmler, there was all of them, and he did it, and I think it was an awfully hard job. I don't think he lived long afterwards. Tell me about the, uh, the Hubble. Okay, the Hubble telescope um, was built, it's got the four optics. Uh, the, I think it's something like three meters in diameter, the primary mirror, and that was made by a company called, I believe it was iTech. And whenever you make the, uh, the final mirrors, the, the, final, the final grinding and polishing of the lens is done with a null lens. And you want to get the image that you keep measuring to come out just right. They used the wrong null lens. So when the Hubble telescope was flown and launched off the shuttle, it never got into focus. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we did at Jet Propulsion Laboratory, the, the primary mirror and the secondary mirror brings a beam back and we have a diagonal flat in that beam that takes the light and brings it down into what we call the wide field uh, planetary camera. I did the conceptual design of the wide field uh, planetary camera and then it was built in, at Caltech and not Jet Propulsion Laboratory and that made me a little bit mad at the time but I did other things while they were doing it. Well they finally launched the thing and it was supposed to advertise that it would see to the end of the universe that was the biggest thing. If you have a big telescope on the Earth that has trouble seeing through the atmosphere, there's never a day a perfect scene and now it clouds the telescope. You get it out in outer space and you can see much further and you get one that's got this, um, this primary mirror that's that big you can see a long ways and it was a failure. Right. And the Hubble family um, well, it was nicknamed the, the Hubble Rubble, as a matter of fact, and the Hubble family um, wanted to take their name off it. Hubble was a very famous astronomer and proved Einstein was wrong. Einstein said we had a static universe and every star and every galaxy was in one single place and would remain there always, and it was Hubble that found out that through his studies that the universe is expanding all the time, so it was named after him. Uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where I work, did not build the Hubble telescope. We just did the wide field planetary camera. But when it failed, we didn't have anything going on in space. We needed it. There's 6,000 people that needed a paycheck. So our director offered to fix the Hubble telescope. Up until that time, it was Goddard's fault. They, they were the ones that built it, that it didn't work. The minute that we said we would fix it, it became our baby. So that was a, a risky thing for him to say. And uh, you certainly can't get your eyes examined on what's wrong with them uh, if you're here and your ophthalmologist is way over there. Well, that's what happened with the, the telescope. We couldn't measure it and see what was wrong, but we got the null lens and did what we call a prescription retrieval. We could see what they did wrong, made a few deft calculations, and made a new wide field planetary camera that's inserted into that exit beam. And well, in a word, what we did was put glasses, corrective glasses, onto it. Uh, then trained the astronauts how to take it, the, that part of it, the Hubble telescope is huge, just our little part is as big as a Volkswagen, and how uh, making an extra vehicular activity, they could go up, take out that part of the camera, take our part that we said was going to fix it, and shove it back in. And when they got that thing into it and they completed the extravehicular activity and was all set to take the first picture, it worked. 
And you must have been so proud. We were so proud of it, but people had spent 16 years on it and it burned them all out. First they had to build the original wide field planetary camera, and then they had to build the corrective ones. So they were working for 16 years on one program, um, which I was spared of because I thought that I was working designing something that was going to be built by jet propulsion. It was built by Caltech instead. But then I got back into it on, on the sidelines. And since then, I, uh, I worked on a Cassini telescope that right now is on its way to Saturn. It, we launched it in 1990, it was launched in 1997. It gets to Saturn 2004, which means it's been around the sun several times. It's gone by the Earth twice. And every time it's gone around the sun, the sun acts as a slingshot. and gives a little bit more of a heft. And finally, it's going to be at Saturn. Um, we've never had the luxury of having a camera that we can refocus in space because you get into the hard environment of space and things will, a cold weld, two pieces of metal will come together and they're going to stay there forever and so we don't have any focus mechanism that will work. We have to set the focus on the Earth, hope that we can survive a very rough launch into space that shakes everything apart and then go for umpteen years in absolute zero and get to a planet and still be in focus. I'm happy to report at this time we've taken a few pictures of stars and the stars are little points, they're not fat stars, so we think it's going to be in focus. And uh, uh, I'd like to come back here one year from today, it's going to be at Saturn in July, and tell you, yes, it did work. Oh, wow. Wouldn't that be exciting? Yeah. Well, I'm glad we're taking this right now because you'll be back next year. And I'll be back next year. And you're going to ask me about the uh, Cassini spacecraft, and I'm going to say, say I never worked on it. <laughs> I, hear, I hear it's not working. Is that true? <laughs> There's many experiments on a spacecraft. They measure the gravity. They measure this and they measure that. They measure the radio waves. They like to see in the atmosphere of the different planets if there's lightning. They do an awful lot of things. but. The public doesn't understand that. Most of the uh, investigators don't understand the results. The one thing that the public does understand is a photograph. Anybody can see something that's out of focus. So um, we've always got our fingers crossed. So far, we've been lucky. But we, uh, luck doesn't come just, just by chance. Uh, every lens, because of the dust in space and so forth, has to have a lens cap. We make sure that our lens cap is optically clear gas, glass. So if we go by a planet, with the lens cap on, we can still see something. We don't want to be the tourist that took the picture with the lens cap not on the camera. We've all been there. Oh my God, this is unbelievable. This is a great story. Incidentally, all of us radiate at about 10 watts. A uh, burglar alarm can detect us in a room because we, we radiate uh, radiation. Uh, at 10 watts. The camera that's on the Voyager spacecraft is a 10 watt camera. There's not much power on a spacecraft. There's, there's very little places to generate it. And we launched that. The Voyager was launched in 1977. It's gone by every single planet, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, uh, up to the end of the solar system. In fact, I think Uranus was further out than Pluto, so we got out there. And at the time that we launched it, it was impossible for that 10-watt radio to transmit a picture, his digital, um, back to the Earth. But during, during the uh, 10, 12, whatever years it took to get to the end of the universe, our technology grew. So the 210-foot dish at Goldstone can receive a picture further out than Pluto from a radio that is only transmitting at 10 watts. Wow. That's something. And it's a good picture, too. I wish uh, you, you, you'd have a chance to go to our theater and talk about pictures. We have uh, some the official Nuremberg photographer took some photographs, and I'd be interested to see your comments because this guy worked with color, one of the first guys to work with color at Nuremberg, and he had an ASA of 10. Of 10? 10. That's yeah. almost inconceivable. That's right. And they didn't have any bright lights. No, that's right. So you'll be. Because now it would be an ASA of 200 or something like oh, that, or more, to, to get that picture. Yes. That meant that he had a very fast lens. That's right. So it was incredible. This is terrific. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you, Greg, for bringing me here. I've enjoyed every minute of it. I've known this house ever since I was born. I've known Bob Jackson from Chestnut Street, from Hanford Avenue, 
I've seen him, I've talked to him. I, well, I said, at least I said hi. But uh, you've made him seem alive to me right now. This is terrific. Thank you. You're welcome.